Vocês estão me escutando bem? Good morning. We have the pleasure and the honor to announce the 31st USP lecture. The USP lectures program began in 2015 with the objective of broadening the access to current scientific discussions and of honoring distinguished researchers. It is intent intended to be accessible to USP co community in general, as well as to the all interested public. Today, Professor Shigeru Miyagawa has already visited USP in 2016 when he gave an USP lecture during our undergraduate research symposium. He has recently been awarded with a grant from FAPESP, the Sao Paulo Excellence Chair, in which he will be collaborating with Professor Carlos Navas from the Institute of Biosciences. I will ask Professor Carlos Navas to introduce to you Professor Shigeru Miyagawa from MIT. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Raul. Uh, it is a pleasure to introduce Professor Shigeru Miya Miyagawa. Uh, he's, um, uh, he's been involved in virtually any aspect of uh, virtual education at uh, uh, MIT. He's been a senior associate dean for open learning and served uh, on the original MIT committee that proposed uh, the open course where he's uh, co-director of uh, one initiative that's called Visualizing Cultures and Produce of uh, the Multimedia Program uh, Star Festival, and was uh, uh, which was awarded the Distinguished Award at the Multimedia Grand Prix 2000 in Japan. He also served as a pro project professor and director of online education for the University of Tokyo as uh, a joint appointment with uh, MIT. As a linguist, he has published several books, including three recent ones from MIT Press and over 60 articles. And he has recently developed a theory of uh, language evolution that hypothesizes that human language arose from the integration of two pre-existing systems in nature, one seen in bird song and the other in primate alarm calls. Professor Shigeru is also the coordinator of uh, a SPEC project. SPEC accounts for Sao Paulo Chair of uh, Excellence, uh, um, as uh, uh, Professor Raul just said. And it's a FAPESP program aimed to uh, bring first-rate researchers from abroad uh, to create research centers uh, in Sao Paulo State Universities. The project uh, we have been awarded is called Innovation in Human and Non-Human Communities. So with this USP talk, we also commemorate the beginning of uh, this uh, project. With this, I would like to invite uh, Professor Shigeru to deliver his talk entitled Human Language in Evolution. Shigeru, thank you for being with us today. It's uh, a treat uh, for us to listen to your lecture. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Um, and thank you for those very kind words. Very delighted to be back at, uh, uh, in Brazil, Sao Paulo, at USP. This is, uh, I believe, my sixth trip to Brazil. And uh, um, I only regret that I cannot speak to you in Portuguese. Um, I, I learned a little bit 
uh, when I was here before, then there was the two-year gap because of the pandemic, and now I've forgotten everything. So <laughs> I have to start all over again with bon dia. And <laughs> my proudest achievement in my career at MIT was that when I was the head of foreign languages at MIT, I established the Portuguese program at MIT. Uh, and I hired a, uh, a wonderful teacher uh, who speaks Brazilian Portuguese. Okay, I made sure it was Brazilian Portuguese. Uh, and so uh, uh, we, we now have a Portuguese, very, very elaborate Portuguese program uh, because I took the initiative to establish it. And I decided, you know, because I received this very, very uh, prestigious award, the Sao Paulo Excellent Chair uh, from FAPESPI, and that I will be able to collaborate with my colleagues here at USPI, I wanted to uh, study Portuguese program in the program that I created. The, but I noticed right away there was a problem. All the other students were Spanish speakers. Uh, I don't speak Spanish. And so <laughs> I could not keep up with the lessons. You know. In the second week of Portuguese one, uh, the teacher was talking about poetry in uh, Portuguese. I had no idea, because I was still trying to say, bon dia, obrigado. And they're talking about poetry. So uh, I decided I better, because uh, I, I would have flunked um, that course. So I decided to step out and then try some other way to uh, learn Portuguese. But I, I, I am very proud of the fact that I created uh, with my, my colleagues at MIT the Portuguese uh, program. Okay. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about something that I have been thinking about uh, for the last uh, 12 years or so uh, as a linguist. And the question, the question itself is a very simple question. The question, how did human language appear in evolution? Yeah. Uh, and because human language doesn't fossilize, because we're talking about the cognitive process, and the writing system, um, which does leave a record, only started a few thousand years ago. But we are talking about uh, something, human language, which emerged much longer uh, before the writing system. Okay? And therefore, uh, we have no his, uh, pre prehistoric record of how human language arose. And so we have to look at other things uh, to study how human language arose. And so that's what we're going to do. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, the brain. And since we need a powerful brain to produce language, uh, we'll be looking at uh, uh, how tool making might help us, stone tool making uh, over the last 3.2 million years. Okay? And how that reflects cognitive advancement, progress in uh, the hominid history. Uh, and as you'll see, something very interesting happened about 100,000 years ago that it was a, a, a fluctuation point. Something happened, okay? Uh, and I'll talk about that. Uh, uh, we'll be oops, talking about uh, uh, stages of language evolution that people have uh, postulated and as you could imagine, there are many, many ideas, uh, and ideas which are competing, people are debating. I'll talk about the debates. I'll talk about, for each idea, the advantages and also disadvantages, and see where we can go with this, trying to make connections with tool making, with a brain uh, evolution. And finally, I will uh, talk about my own idea of language evolution, the I call integration hypothesis, which I published uh, back in uh, 2013 with uh, 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 Okanoya and uh, Bob Berwick of uh, MIT. 
Uh, the today, uh, today's talks are drawn from a couple of articles that I wrote. Uh, the beginning of innovation, which is on Medium, which is an open source uh, platform, so you can uh, take a look at that. Uh, and also the integration hypothesis, a parallel model of language development in evolution. Uh, it's, uh, the draft of it is on my uh, website, shigerumiyaga.com. Um, I think I have uh, either articles or drafts of uh, all of my publications on my uh, web website, so uh, do take a look. Okay, so uh, language is, uh, you know, what people say is the defining trait of who we are as human beings. You know, we are very, very close genetically to our most immediate uh, ancestors, the, uh, the, uh, the primates, like bonobos, chimpanzees. We are something like 97% the same uh, in our genetic makeup with our previous um, ancestors. Okay? But there is one trait, there's one trait that clearly distinguishes us, us as homo sapiens from the earlier primates, and that is human language and everything that's related to human language, you know, uh, abstract thinking. And as we'll see, there's something about abstract thinking, symbolic thinking, that distinguishes us from other primates. And we're going to see this in tool making, and we're also going to see this in a very dramatic uh, fashion with the development of the brain. There was a fluctuation point in the development of the brain where something really happened, and we can see it. And that's the, the point where we believe that uh, Homo sapiens became cognitively ready to sp start speaking language and uh, uh, present other modern human behavior like music, art, and religion. Uh, and we think that all of this happened about 100,000 years ago. Okay, so that's very recent, very recent. Because Homo sapiens, now we think, uh, appeared in Africa about 200, maybe 300,000 years ago. Okay. Uh, we keep getting older and older as people discover you know, other uh, pieces of evidence. It used to be 200,000, but now it looks like uh, we've been around a little bit earlier. Uh, but that's still just a drop in the bucket when you consider all of uh, biological and geologic evolutionary time. Okay. Um, the Earth uh, has been around for billions of years, billions of years. So 100, 200, 300,000 years is just like yesterday, like this morning. And so we, we've been here for just a blink of an eye. And even uh, more, more later, somehow language developed. Okay. So we're going to be looking at that. Um, one thing about uh, talking about human language and evolution is that, you know, as I said, language doesn't fossilize, so we, we don't have direct evidence for it. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, the Linguistic Society of Paris in 1866 banned all discussion about human language and evolution, uh, saying that we don't have direct evidence, it's just guesswork, we're just talking about fiction, and so we have to stop talking about it. Okay? Um, I think that there is some wisdom to that ban that was imposed by the uh, Linguistic Society of Paris, uh, however, I think that now, um, over a, a 140 years, we've come to gain more knowledge about many things, uh, about non-human and human brain, about animal communication, human language, tool making, uh, so that today we are in a better place to talk about uh, human language and evolution but we have to always keep in mind, and this is true with anything uh, that have to do with this kind of research, 
we have to really anchor what we are saying in empirical evidence. Okay? Otherwise, there's a danger that we start uh, creating sort of uh, fiction okay, without being anchored. Uh, you know. But then, at the same time, you know, we have to be courageous to, to try uh, new things, new ways of looking. Okay? And so there's this balance between being empirically grounded so that we are doing scientific research. At the same time, we have to be willing to take chances, take risks. Okay? It's always this balance. Uh, some say that uh, the question of uh, human language and evolution is the hardest problem in science because it's very difficult to come up with compelling, convincing evidence. Okay? We don't have, to this day, any single piece of evidence that says, there, that's when human language started. Okay? We don't have that. Okay? Uh, but what I'm trying to do is to come up with a host of things that we can study, like tool making, brain formation, that hopefully sometime and sometime soon, maybe one of you or many of you uh, will make this breakthrough where things coalesce into a compelling uh, piece, pieces of evidence. My hope, in fact, is that in this uh, um, award that uh, we received, the Sao Paulo Excellent Chair, where we have this remarkable uh, uh, array of, of, of uh, scholars from biology, archaeology, linguistics, uh, primatology, uh, which is a very unusual uh, group of uh, very diverse uh, people from um, different ki uh, kinds of fields. Okay. This is exactly what we need to try to solve the problem. The problem with research on human language and evolution is that people have been looking just at, your, at their own discipline. Okay. And with that, you know, it's like this uh, old Indian um, mythology. You, go, you walk into a dark room, there's an elephant, but you cannot see it. So you, one person goes and touches, and he says, I think it's this. And someone else comes in, all dark, and touches another part of elephant, and I, you, know, you don't get the full picture of the elephant. Okay. Uh, and so we need people working from diverse uh, areas in order to come up with a complete picture, okay. because we are working in the dark. Um, Something very puzzling about human language and human cognition in general is, as I said, uh, language is what distinguishes us from our earlier ancestors, like bonobos and chimpanzees okay, and great apes. Um, Charles Darwin, who developed uh, the theory of human evolution uh, by natural selection, where uh, evolution of all kinds by living entities will evolve gradually, small step, small step, small step. What he called descent with modification. Okay? Each succeeding generation will be slightly modified from the earlier generation because of the, the genetic design. Uh, but uh, the rule is that it has to be a gradual small step each time. Okay? Uh, and the modification is sort of triggered by natural selection to give you advantage so that the next generation becomes somehow better adapted to the environment to survive and thrive. Okay. What Charles Darwin said is that there's something very puzzling about human brain, human mind, in that we made a huge leap from monkeys to uh, the brain. He said, the difference between the mind of the lowest man and that of the highest animal is immense. Exactly what you don't expect. Exactly what you don't expect under Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. Okay? You expect little step, 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 but instead somewhere there was a great leap that gave us the kind of cognitive capacity to have 
things like human language okay, and other modern human behavior that distinguish us from bonobos and chimpanzees and so forth. Darwin was very puzzled by this. Okay? We're still puzzled by this. Uh, Alfred Russell Wallace, who was a contemporary to Darwin, and he himself developed uh, his own evolutionary theory, not only was puzzled by this great leap that we made, but he was also puzzled by the fact that this great leap that Homo sapiens made in, in cognition allowed us to, to uh, have the capacity to have language, music, the arts, and religion. Okay? He said, these don't give us real benefit, evolution, evolutionary benefit. Okay? Uh, the fact that we, we were able to create music because of this great leap doesn't make us any Strong, any stronger than before. Okay? Um, the fact that we, we were able to have religion doesn't give us the capacity to more efficiently digest food, for example. Okay? So uh, Wallace was really puzzled, not just by the leap, but because of the leap, the kind of cognitive uh, capabilities that we were able to have. It did not make any sense whatsoever uh, under the, the kind of theory that they're working with, you know, evolution, gradual evolution by natural selection. Okay? Uh, so, uh, how did human language develop? Okay, there are a couple of uh, theories, and we're going to be looking at this. Uh, one is what's called gra gradualist view. It's a very reasonable view that mirrors Charles Darwin's idea that evolution occurred in small steps. Uh, the idea for uh, these people who believe in the gradualist view, uh, and th these are very eminent people like Steven Pinker, uh, Jack and uh, Herford, and Provovac, they believe that human language started with a simple stage one where, let's say, there was one word to communicate, followed by stage two, there were two words, and then three words, and somewhere along the way, grammar developed to uh, organize all of those words into sentences and expressions. Okay? That's uh, one view, uh, the gradualist view. The second view is called the emergent view. Uh, this says that human language pretty much happened abruptly, somewhere in evolution, possibly about 100,000 years ago. There are two versions of the emergent view. The well-known one, the more well-known one, uh, says that human language basically happened out of the blue sometime about 100, maybe 120,000 years ago. Uh, this has uh, very eminent uh, uh, people such as Chomsky, Berwick, and Chomsky who uh, believe in this. Uh, second version uh, is something that I propose uh, in which uh, and I said, yes, human language as we know it today appeared about 100, maybe 120,000 years ago, but it did not just come out of uh, thin air, but that the parts that make up human language, and we'll talk about what we mean by parts, parts that make up human language have been there for a long time, maybe millions of years. And something happened, as Chomsky says, something happened to integrate these two parts uh, uniquely in humans to give us language. Okay? So it's both a gradualist and an emergent view, this idea of integration hypothesis. And I'll talk about that. Okay, in order to have uh, human language, uh, we, ha we need a brain, a powerful brain. So let's uh, start with that. Uh, human language requires a powerful brain. And so if we go back to uh, Australopithecus, uh, a, uh, our ancestor, which looked like a monkey, but uh, the, the one difference from uh, primates, earlier primates, is that Australopithecus started to make tools okay, for the first time that we know. Uh, Charles Darwin uh, conjectured that the reason why our brain kept growing and growing and growing was that 
First, we became bipedal. And what that did was to free up our hands. Okay? We didn't have to crawl on four, but then by becoming bipedal, by standing up, we were able to uh, free up our hands. And by freeing up our hands, we started to create tools which had a real cognitive uh, impact. And because of that, our brain kept growing. This interesting idea. Um, and if you look at the growth of the brain, it is incredible, the, the growth of the brain. So starting with uh, uh, Australopithecus, um, three million years ago here, this is where we see the first tool that uh, I'll show you, the Lomequian. Uh, from there all the way to uh, this is Neanderthal uh, at the top. The brain has uh, grown to be three times from Australopithecus right up to Neanderthal and Homo sapiens. Three times, okay. uh, which is a remarkable, remarkable growth. Okay. Uh, and so because of this, in fact, Neanderthal, which is the um, hominid prior to Homo sapien, had a brain that was even bigger than Homo sapien size. And the reason is that uh, their visual cortex in the back was much, much bigger. They were able to see better than us. And the reason for that is that Neanderthals lived in dark places like Northern Europe. And this was the Ice Age, so it was pretty dark. And so they developed really good eyesight. And you can see it by the bigger visual cortex, uh, which gave them about, I believe, 10% more brain volume than us. Okay. Otherwise, their brain was similar to ours. If you look at the growth of the brain, along the, the, that period of about three million years, there's something very interesting. It was not a gradual uh, growth, but there were places where the brain started to grow rapidly, and then it really shot up. You can see that uh, starting with uh, Australopithecus down here, there was a gradual but uh, uh, perceptible growth here, and people hypothesize that that growth has to do with uh, becoming bipedal and then being able to hunt, being able to use tools to uh, crush roots so that you can digest a little bit easier. And that nutrient uh, gave the brain more, uh, more nutrients to grow. But what's really remarkable is that what happened after that you can see that there's this almost a straight up growth here uh, from Homo erectus about 1.7 million years ago all the way to Homo sapiens. It's almost a straight up. Okay. What happened there? Well, uh, what happened there, as many people uh, have uh, surmised, and I think it's a very reasonable uh, idea, is that what happened was that uh, our ancestors discovered fire. Okay. Um, by taming fire uh, to cook uh, like tree roots and others, uh, what our ancestors like, like Homo erectus uh, and, and later uh, like uh, 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 Neanderthals. Neanderthals, by the way, tamed fire. Uh, earlier uh, hominids use fire, but they didn't tame it. They just found fire in nature and used it uh, to, to, um, to do things. But Neanderthals uh, were able to tame it, and they were able to create fire on their own and became part of the culture, uh, life of uh, uh, their life. Uh, but by, by creating fire, by taming it, uh, uh, Neanderthals and then Homo erectus were able to cook food okay? so that they were able to pre-digest food outside of their body before they took it in. Okay? So wh 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 what resulted from that? Well, 
the two systems in our body that use most calories are the digestive system and the brain. The digestive system and the brain. When the uh, Neanderthals were able to tame fire and cook, uh, they were able to pre-digest food outside of their body so that when they took in the food, they were uh, able to get pretty much 100% nutrients from uh, uh, the food that they were digesting. Okay? So the digestive system had less burden to digest that, much less burden. Okay? And as a result, all the additional uh, energy, calories, went to our brain. And that really turbocharged the growth of the brain. Okay? So fire. Uh, there's something else that happened with fire. Before fire, uh, our ancestors, like Homo erectus, were spending eight hours a day gathering food as um, hunter-gatherers and chewing. They were literally chewing, chewing, chewing. Okay? You see this among um, great apes and, and others today. They have to chew okay, uh, all day long to be able to digest the food. And that was true with our hominids as well, like Homo erectus and earlier. They're spending eight hours a day just to feed themselves, gathering food and feed, and chew, 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 chew. Okay? But once they discovered fire, they were able to pre-digest the food. So instead of eight hours, uh, they only spent four hours. Okay? Uh, and uh, instead of uh, the pre-fire, when they were getting about 30%, from uh, roots and so forth uh, of nutrients today or after fire, they were able to get 100% pretty much nutrient from the, um, uh, what they're taking, 30% okay? to about 100%. Okay? So uh, not only were we able to extract nutrients uh, completely thanks to fire, but thanks to fire, uh, the time we spent gathering and, and uh, cooking and uh, digesting food went from, 30, uh, from eight hours to four hours. Okay. With all that free time, uh, our ancestors were able to spend more time with other things, and I suspect that they were starting to develop modern human behavior, like language, like art, like religion, like music, uh, because of the free time. Okay. Uh, or may maybe taking college courses at USP. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, incidentally, when I saw this uh, difference between 30% before fire, uh, the nutrient uh, percentage, and 100% after fire, you know, it occurred to me uh, as I checked my email that you know, uh, I'm sure you've had the same experience. When you check uh, whatever your know, social media, email is maybe too, too old time for you, you know, we, I think, receive uh, of all the information we get every day, at most, 30% is usable, at most. Uh, everything else we, we delete, we trash, and so forth, because it's useless. Okay? It occurred to me that we are, in our information age, we are in pre-fire uh, stage. Okay? Uh, we're in a pre-fire stage. We are still very primitive uh, beings when it comes to information. Every day we have to spend so much time just to get maybe 30% that's usable information. Okay? At some point, and maybe one of you, will have to discover fire. Okay? So that instead of all this junk that we are having to sift through, we can get 100% informational nutrient. And so we can spend more time you know, doing useful things instead of delete, 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 which I do all day long. Right? So we keep that, keep that in mind. It's, it's absolutely true. We are in a pre-fire uh, period when it comes to information. We are, uh, we, are, uh, in homo, we are homo erectus right now in terms of, uh, we are not homo sapiens in terms of information. We are very primitive, okay? Very primitive, so. Um, so we saw that 
the size of the brain grew by three times from the Australopithecine uh, brain of uh, three million years ago to today. But something very strange is happening right now. In the last 20 years, after growing uh, by three times over the last three million years, in the last 20 years, our brain has reduced in size by about 13%. Okay? That's the size of a, a tennis ball. Okay. Uh, our brain is now shrinking after growing for three million years. Okay? So this is going to be a puzzle that is part of the picture of the solution to the question, how and when did human language emerge in evolution? We'll come back to that. Okay, uh, so the next topic, now that we talked about the brain, uh, I want to go into tool making. Okay. Uh, so is there evidence that language as we know it today emerged about 100,000 years ago? Why not say 500,000 years ago? Well, uh, we don't have any definitive evidence that uh, it, uh, uh, it occurred 300,000 years ago, but there are some intriguing pieces of evidence that we can actually study that points to about 100 to 120,000 years ago as a fluctuation point when something happened to our brain. If you look at the uh, tool making, okay, which we can study, the oldest tool that we know of that's been discovered is what's called the Lomachian tool. 3.3 uh, million years ago, these are Australopithecine, very monkey-like, except that they were bipedal. The um, uh, Lomachian tool was discovered in northern Kenya by a couple of uh, uh, archaeologists from uh, Stony Brook University in uh, New York. The way that they discovered the Lomachian is actually a, a story in itself and something for you to remember. I see many, many young people here. Uh, the two archaeologists were heading for a well-known site of archaeological artifacts. Somewhere along the way, they took a wrong turn and they became lost. And they ended up in an area which had not been excavated in any way. Uh, instead of saying, we better turn back, they didn't have GPS, right? <laughs> they, they said, okay, I don't know where we are, but we better turn out. Instead of saying that, I said, Let's see what we can find in this area. Okay, no one's ever uh, excavated this area. So they started to excavate this area, and voila, they found this, these uh, big uh, tools that's been napped, which kind of carved with one blade. So very big. Uh, and once they were dated, it was 3.3 million years ago, absolutely the oldest tool. Okay. Before then, the older one tool uh, was considered the oldest, and that was uh, 2.6 million years ago. Okay. So by pure mistake, by pure mistake, uh, they, they found this. Okay. You see this in science a lot. Okay. Uh, I believe that probably every Nobel Prize research did not begin by the scientists trying to solve that problem that led to the Nobel Prize. Okay. You hear these scientists saying, well, I wanted to solve this problem. I kept going at it. I kept... And then some point, at some point they said, that's a strange phenomenon. I wonder what that is. And then they took uh, you know, a side street. Voila, they found the Lomequian tool of their research that led to the Nobel Prize. So you have to really trust you have to trust your intuition that although it's not what you are looking for, there's something really, really interesting. Okay? Um, I, mean, I recently published a, a book uh, from MIT Press on human language. And that book uh, was because of a pure accident, uh, a discovery of some data from uh, uh, some languages which were not so well known. I just happened to see it. I said, I wonder what that is. And I kept thinking about it. Uh, and it led to a whole book. So trust your intuition. 
But that intuition has to be informed by a lot of knowledge about a lot of fields. So the more that you know, uh, the more interesting and, and um, deep insights that you'll have. And I will come back to that in just a second. So Lomakian to 3.3 million years ago. A million years later, the older one tool shows up uh, again in Africa, in Ethiopia. Ethiopia was so sort of the Silicon Valley of stone tool making. Okay, that's where things were really happening. Right? Uh, and the older one tool is a smaller piece of tool, as you can see. And, uh, uh, but like the Lomakian, just the one side uh, has been napped uh, with a blade. And this was actually a very good tool. It was a very handy tool. Uh, and um, the earlier hominids and then Homo erectus took this. And unlike the Lomakian, which did not spread, okay, the, or the earlier Lomakian to appear and then just completely disappear. As if the, uh, the hominids, uh, the Australopithecine, okay, had the brain power to create the tool, but they didn't have the brain power to create a culture for spreading the knowledge to spread the tool with Lomequian. Okay? They, had the, the, they had the brain power to say, ah, if we nap this, we can create something interesting, but then they stop there. Okay? Uh, but with tool making, uh, you have to have the, the, on top of your ability to create it, you have to have a culture that transmits knowledge to others so that it'll spread. But clearly with the older one, uh, where our hominids had a bigger brain, uh, they had not only the power to create the tool, but the power to create a culture around it to transmit knowledge to spread it. And they spread it all over, okay? uh, all over Africa, into the Middle East, into Asia, and into Northern Europe. Uh, this was a very cold time in uh, Europe, for example, uh, but the Homo erectus that spread this uh, were able to survive because this tool uh, allowed them to sort of shear hide and create warm clothing. So they were able to, to survive and thrive because of this tool. But there's something very interesting about this. Notice, uh, older one, uh, appeared about 2.4 million years ago, and almost a, it lasted for almost a million years. Okay? Almost a million years. Okay? And during that time, it didn't change very much. Okay? That's like, you know, uh, you have iPhone 1, okay? and for, for a million years, you have iPhone 1. Okay? <laughs> Unthinkable. They didn't create an you know, older one, too next year and older one three the following year, like our iPhone. Okay? Instead, they had older one one that lasted for a million years. Okay? So this is a crucial, crucial idea. Innovation was very slow. Okay? It lasted, in fact, it lasted a million years. The, um, the hominids, like Homo erectus, were more concerned about spreading it all over the world, okay? instead of innovating and creating uh, a new version. And we're going to see this um, again when we look at the next tool, uh, what's called the Ashurian tool, again created in Ethiopia, as far as we know, about 1.7 million years ago. Okay? So almost a million years after older one. The thing that is uh, striking about the Ashurian tool is that uh, um, it's like the old one in that you have napped edges, but it's bifacial. Okay? It has symmetry. It's quite beautiful. Uh, and uh, it was created by Homo erectus. Um, and uh, uh, again, it lasted for uh, almost a million years, as you can see from 1.7 uh, million years ago uh, to the next one that you'll see in a second. Okay? Uh, but this was created by the Homo erectus and spread uh, out, out of Africa. You know, the Homo erectus was around about 1.2 million years. Okay. We've been around at most 300,000 years. Okay. 
Are we going to make it to 400,000 years? I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, Homo erectus was a much more successful hominid, I think, that we <laughs> will ever be. Okay. They created this incredible uh, technology. But uh, instead of uh, uh, creating some new version every year or even every 100,000 years, once they created it, it lasted for a million years again. Uh, this uh, Acheulean tool that you saw, the bifacial one, spread out of Africa. It by stopped at what's called the Mobius line from uh, today's India to northern Europe. Below the Mobius line, you had uh, the Acheulean tool, the, the bifacial, and the older one, the older tool. But uh, on the other side of the Mobius line, uh, the Ashurian tool, for some reason, did not spread. And so uh, over here, you have just one, the older one, the older one. Okay? Uh, but as far as we know, at least in this, this area, for the first time in hominid history, you had not only one, but two different styles of tools okay? uh, coexisting. And this is going to be very important. This is going to be very important when you think about the development of uh, uh, the cognitive process. Uh, then uh, almost a hundred, uh, almost a million years later, you get the, the late Ashurian tool, the next tool. And it's like the earlier Ashurian tool in that it's bifacial, but as you can see, it is much more refined. It, it's thinner, okay, and it's much better refined than the early Acheulean. Uh, if you compare the early Acheulean with the late Acheulean, you can see that the late Acheulean is thinner and much more uh, refined. Not only that, in this late Acheulean, you see something that we've never, ever seen before, artistry. Okay? If you look at the late Acheulean, these are beautiful pieces. You see, for example, on this side, uh, this bifacial late Acheulean tool not only is utilitarian, but he has artistry. The person who created this chose a piece of rock with a shell in the middle, okay, which has absolutely no functional okay, role. It is there for decoration. Uh, the tool maker who chose this chose a piece of rock with beautiful pigmentation. Okay. Uh, here again, the, the, the color has no utilitarian purpose. Okay. It is there. Basically, basically uh, the, the tool maker cared about what other people thought of their tool. Okay. Uh, and so artistry. Okay. So there was self-expression through these tools, above and beyond just creating tools. Um, okay, uh, so that's uh, uh, late Acheulean, and this uh, lasted for, in this case, 300,000 years. Okay. Uh, and then uh, comes the Neanderthals, and they created a technology that was just remarkable, what's called the Mysterian tools, and this changed everything. This changed absolutely everything. As you can see by this little graphic, what the Mysterian tool involves, unlike before where they were just napping rock that they found, they uh, started with a, uh, the base uh, rock, and then they carved out a pieces, as you can see, from that, and then created sharp, small pieces like this. These are small, sharp pieces, uh, which are thinner, lighter, and that allowed them to create things like spear heads for weapons. That wouldn't have been possible with Ashurian, because that was just way too big. Okay. So uh, with the Mosterian and what's called the uh, Levalois technique, they were able to create these small, sharp pieces. And that changed everything. Okay. And this is uh, Neanderthal. The Neanderthals were amazing, amazing hominids. Okay. They tamed fire and they created this uh, uh, Mysterian tool. Okay. And that lasted for 300,000 years. And now things change in a dramatic way. 
Okay. Instead of a million years, okay, uh, instead of 500,000 years, right after the Mysterion showed up, um, suddenly, about 100 to 120,000 years ago, there was this huge, huge speeding up of innovation. Okay. Uh, from a million year uh, gap between innovations, now you have only thousands of years before the next formation, a thousand years. Okay. Not only that, and this is really important for today. Remember, before we had at most two different tools coexisting below the, um, that line in Africa, the older one and the early Ashurian, okay, at most two. But all of a sudden, once uh, the tool making speeded up, we had an explosion of uh, different styles of tools all over Africa, as you can see. Um, and so there is something important about innovation here that we can learn from. And that is that the more diverse the ideas, uh, the more quickly that you can create uh, and, and, and become much more creative with your ideas. Okay? Nature, evolution, likes diversity. Okay? We don't see that uh, always in today's society. Right? Uh, what's happening in today's society? Uh, we have these very powerful companies. Google, Apple, uh, Meta, Facebook, okay, that control innovation to a great extent. Okay. Uh, I, what used to be a very diverse uh, um, innovation environment okay, with many, 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 many small companies, now these huge companies are controlling how innovation is going to emerge. So I'm a little bit worried that we're getting away from this lesson in human evolution where diversity really led to the kind of beings that we are, okay, or the modern behavior. So um, that's something to keep in mind, diversity. Okay? I mean, everything about uh, today's society is actually getting, out, getting us away from it. Uh, universities, your university, my university, okay, they tend to be discipline-oriented, which means there's less diversity because you're just studying your discipline. Okay? You're not really exposed as much to other disciplines across campus. Um, you know, one thing I'm just really pleased and quite impressed is that we were able to create this amazing and diverse group of scholars for the SPEC project that we are about to embark on. You know, you have biologists, you have archaeologists, you have primatologists, you have linguists. Uh, that, that is unheard of. I have never heard of such uh, a diverse group of scholars anywhere, not at MIT, not at Harvard, not at Max Planck. Okay. So this is uh, something that I find very diverse, uh, very promising, and exactly what led to the kind of uh, uh, development in evolution that led to our, um, who we are. Uh, the second thing that uh, people point to, uh, remember, so the idea is that about 100,000 years ago, there was this huge leap in uh, uh, technology for stone making, okay? from uh, a million years to just tens of thousands of years, and an explosion of styles. The second thing that people point to as possibly source of some cognitive leap that led to human language has to do with these ochres that were found in uh, the Bombos cave in South Africa. Uh, this is a very famous piece. It's a small piece, uh, an ochre, which is an iron-rich material. And what they found in this uh, cave in Southern Africa is are uh, these patterns that you see. Okay. Um, these patterns that you see, which are very um, symmetrical okay? and looks like some kind of abstract representation of thought. And people surmise that this is uh, a cognitive projection of abstract symbolic thinking uh, 
which is similar to human language, because human language is abstract, symbolic representation of the physical world. Uh, and so, and this has been dated to about 73,000 years ago. It's about the similar time as the explosion of tool making. So there, we're just trying to triangulate. Okay? Tool making, Blombo's cave, uh, maybe something else uh, to give us uh, some plausible, plausible uh, idea that uh, human language arose about 100 to 120,000 years ago okay? because our cognitive capacity somehow made a great leap, leap that really puzzled Charles Darwin. I remember uh, that there was this puzzle with the human brain that in the last 20,000 years, uh, our homo sapien brain went from uh, whatever the size to minus 13%, but the size of a tennis ball. Okay. Our brain is shrinking now okay, for the first time. Why is that? Why is our brain shrinking? Okay. I'm sure all of you have ideas about that. This is simply a fact. Okay. Nothing guessed uh, uh, about this. Why is our brain shrinking? Okay. You know, think about that. Okay. Well, what I think may be happening is that because of this human cognitive leap, the way we process information changed fundamentally about 100,000 years ago. Before this great leap, our brain was processing all the data that was coming in okay, and somehow trying to deal with that. Just as I suspect the primates, birds uh, are doing today. But once this big leap occurred, okay, somehow we changed as, uh, as um, um, a, a biological entity where we began to look at the world abstractly, symbolically. Okay? We didn't have to process everything that was coming in and trying to make sense of all of the raw data that was coming in. Okay, we look at the raw data and and cherry pick the data that we think is important and then somehow create an abstract representation of the world okay? and that's how we deal with the world today. So we didn't, our brain didn't have to deal with as much data. Our brain didn't have to compute as much raw data. Okay? Our brain, as I said earlier, is a uh, is very expensive uh, membrane. Uh, and so if we don't need it, then you start shedding it. And so in the last 20,000 years, which means it's been happening for 100,000 years, uh, our brain is shedding the membrane so that um, we are able to have less brain to compute what we need. Um, at this rate, uh, our brain is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller, not that we're going to get dumber, okay? Uh, maybe, <laughs> we don't know, <laughs> hope not. But, uh, you know, a lot of the computing that was done on the brain is now done by our smartphone, okay? So this is the part of the brain. Maybe in uh, uh, 500,000 years, our brain is going to be the size of our iPhone 200 or something, okay? But it is getting smaller. And I believe that uh, it has to do with the fact that we have become a symbolic being. Okay? And that has given us the ability to have language okay? uh, and other kinds of uh, modern human behavior like art, religion, and so forth. Okay. Um, I think I may... Um, So let me uh, very quickly wrap up in a few minutes. Uh, uh, em emergence of modern human behavior. Okay. Uh, so as we saw, the there was an inflection point about 100,000 years ago. It's the first sign of modern human behavior. Modern human behavior refers to uh, things like language, things like religion, art, uh, and music, which we don't see among primates. Okay. Uh, the fact that the emerged seems like 
pretty abruptly about 100,000 years ago. Uh, in a very, you know, Neanderthals did have some um, behavior that uh, uh, can be said as artistic. They drew cave art, but it was very limited. And you didn't see the kind of ex explosion uh, of uh, um, art, music, religion in Neanderthals that we saw with Homo sapiens. So I think there's something that really happened in Homo sapiens that was uh, fundamental to Homo sapiens. So this kind of sudden appearance of this kind of behavior uh, favors what's called the emergent view. And that is the language that's pop up, popped up about 100 to 120,000 years ago. Are good. Uh, but there's, uh, there are problems with the uh, uh, emergent view. Uh, you know, if you try to learn a foreign language, as I have tried to do with Portuguese, it's a very complex system. It takes years and years and years, and you can never get it right. right? So how can something that complex, it's the most complex cognitive system we know, uh, could have just popped up uh, out of thin air uh, some 100,000 years ago. Okay. So there's something um, not quite right about the emergent view. Okay. There's something else uh, that is a challenge to the emergent view, and that is that uh, for human language to operate, uh, there are specialized areas of the brain that you need. And the two well-known areas are the Broca's area, uh, and uh, the Wernicke's area okay, here. Um, Broca's area is for language production, and Wernicke's area is for language perception. You need both production and perception, um, and uh, both are located in the left hemisphere for 90% of the population. And so the question is, when did these two areas, Broca and uh, Wernicke's areas, develop? Uh, if uh, the emergent view is right, if, it's, if it was an abrupt development, you would think that these developed around the time the human language appeared. Okay? But that was not the case. There's evidence that uh, our older hominids, like Homo habilis and Homo erectus, like about millions of years ago, um, had Broca's area and Wernicke's area from the study of their skull. Uh, in fact, there are homologues of uh, uh, Broca and Wernicke's areas in great apes. And there you're talking about like six million years ago. Okay. There's, so there's something not quite right uh, with the emergent view, the abrupt um, emergent of human language uh, with the evidence for Broca's and Wernicke's that have been around for millions of years. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, language seem to have appeared about 100,000 years ago. So how do we make sense of this? Uh, the suggestion that I made is that uh, human language indeed appeared about 100 to 120,000 years ago. But unlike the, um, the emergent view that has been proposed by people like Chomsky, uh, who's my mentor, by the way, my office mate at MIT, um, what I propose is that human language is made up of two components, alpha and beta, that uh, have been in nature for millions of years. Okay. Uh, and that, so uh, they have been there for millions of years. Somehow, because of the cognitive leap about 100 to 120,000 years ago, the two components, alpha and beta, integrated uniquely in human beings to give rise to human language. But if you break it apart, if you break it apart, uh, you find alpha and beta, which you find in other animals. Okay. Um, and I'm just going to tell you what they are, okay, and then I'll stop. So what are the two components, alpha and beta? Alpha is uh, what I consider to be uh, what you find in, uh, in primate alarm calls, like snake, leopard, eagle, 
very famous uh, study of um, uh, uh, primates in Africa, where they have these aramco, single utterances, like words. If they see a snake, they'll say snake, snake, snake. Uh, and uh, um, the whole community climbs up the tree to uh, uh, avoid the prey. If, if there's an eagle coming, they say the eagle, 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 and everyone climbs down the tree. Yeah. Uh, the important thing is that these are individual words, uh, individual utterances, like words. So that's what I call the lexical system, L system. You find L system all over nature, all over nature. So that's the L system. Uh, and I believe that's the, uh, the source for words that we find in human language. But we don't just speak in words. Words are organized into sentences, what we call grammar. And that's independent of words. Okay? Grammar creates patterns. Now, where did the, the, this generation of patterns come from? Well, when you look across nature, you find bird song. Okay? Bird songs are systems that create patterns. Okay? All of you have heard birds sing. They create patterns. Okay? Each note does not have meaning. Okay? It's not like birds are singing with words in those patterns like uh, the, the monkeys. Okay? Each note has no meaning. They're just creating patterns. And they're singing in order to convey some intention. Okay? Of, often, uh, most often an intention to uh, the desire to mate. And so alpha and beta, and I call this the expressive system, the E system, a system that creates patterns. And you find this all over nature as well. Bird song, gibbons, which is a small primate, uh, sings. Maybe whale system, maybe the purpose system is an E system. So you have two systems, E system like birds, L system like uh, primates. Uh, they have been around for millions of years, they exist all over nature. But uniquely in humans, they somehow integrated because of some special cognitive capacity that we gained about 120,000 years ago. Now, I don't know how that integration happened. If it happened, it's, it's still a hypothesis. But it does explain uh, a puzzle, as I said. And the puzzle is this. We have more and more evidence that human language and other modern behavior, like art, religion, and music, somehow appeared almost abruptly about 100 to 120,000 years ago in a very explosive, massive way. Okay. Uh, we don't have evidence for anything like that prior to 120,000 years ago. Okay. And yet, these systems, like language, are just hugely complex. So it is unthinkable that it just came out of the blue. Okay? It had to be, have been developing somehow uh, for a long time, maybe millions of years. So the, the integration hypothesis tries to solve that puzzle by saying, yes, human language and other modern human behavior abruptly appeared about 120,000 years ago, but the pieces of human language have been around for millions of years in the E systems that you find in bird song and L system that you find in primates. And somehow they integrated. So that's the integration hypothesis. Uh, I'm going to be looking at this with uh, colleagues uh, from USP uh, to see if we can come up with better evidence uh, looking at uh, uh, primate uh, um, behavior um, and uh, looking at even frogs, okay, looking at uh, the human brain, and, uh, and so forth. So I'm very much looking forward to that. If you are interested in uh, learning more about the integration hypothesis, okay, um, you know, so in 2013, I wrote an article with colleagues that saying the human language arose from uh, integra integration of primate system and birdsong system. 
Uh, but interestingly, the media got really interested but reported as Miyagawa said that human language came from Barcelona, <laughs> which I didn't say. <laughs> but somehow that got traction and uh, BBC um, Radio 4, which is a very famous uh, um, program, uh, created this wonderful 30-minute uh, program uh, on, um, based on uh, my integration hypothesis, what the songbird said, uh, beautifully produced by uh, Angie Sani, Sa, Sanini, uh, who's a very eminent uh, science journalist from BBC. Uh, in fact, won the uh, AAAS um, Science Documentary of the Year for 2016. So and it's available now. You can listen to it uh, and, and other things as well. So um, uh, take a listen. It's a radio program. You can, it's like a podcast now. You can listen to it anytime. Okay? Uh, and finally, um, something completely unexpected uh, happened as a result of the BBC uh, program. Um, Pete Wire, who is a well-known composer of music, uh, heard the, um, the BBC program, and he was inspired by it. And he had a, um, um, an assignment from the New York Financial uh, District. They have a musical season, and he was uh, assigned to uh, do the opening piece. And uh, he decided to create this series of um, songs called Song uh, of the Human, and um, um, it's this beautiful piece. And actually, I guess we don't have sound for for it. I wonder if you could hear it. It's qu quite beautiful, but you can, I think you can find it. Um, let's see if I if I can. today. <laughs> but trust me, it's really beautiful. <laughs> it's one of those, you got to be kidding kind of uh, things uh, um, to have this kind of thing happen. You know? um, so anyway, uh, that's it. Um, and so the, the takeaway from this, you know, is that there's a puzzle uh, about something that happened to our brain about 120,000 years ago. It was a huge cognitive leap. Uh, it led to modern human behavior, including, we believe, language. Okay. Uh, my idea is that uh, the great leap was not that all, all of these things came out, came out of thin air, but that uh, the cognitive leap allowed us to integrate what we already had uh, for millions of years into something new, and that is human language we became a symbolic being. And as a result, we're able to create all of these wonderful things like music, religion, scientific thought, okay, uh, and language. But as a result of becoming an abstract entity, we no longer, we no longer uh, digested everything that came in. We only di uh, used uh, certain kinds of data, and so uh, th that uh, less burden on our brain, and so our brain became smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, an important point is that that kind of innovation, the explosion in innovation that you find in evolution took place because of diversity, okay? uh, something that we don't always see in our society today, uh, but clearly diversity gave us the kind of massive innovation, much more than what we see today. You know, the kind of innovation you saw in Africa uh, and other parts of the world 120,000 years ago, much more uh, fundamental than things like internet and so forth. Uh, I hope that we will get back to the kind of diverse 
uh, behavior and innovation that we had before all these huge corporations started to take over. Okay. I'd, I'd like for you to keep that in mind. Okay. Thank you so much. We have some minutes for some questions. I will ask Rebecca to, to carry the microphone. Well, I have two questions. Uh, first, I noticed you updated your slide and the brain size reduction used to be 16% and now it's 13%. Is that correct? Or, um, from your last talk. Uh, you mean the size of the brain? Yeah, you, 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 you used to show that the, 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 that slide with the tennis ball and the reduction was 16%. Oh, okay. So now it's 13. <laughs> I'm just wondering why, why that wow, reduction you're... reduced. <laughs> <laughs> I probably chose the wrong slide. Okay. okay. No problem. <laughs> now, I, wow. Okay. You notice you've you got to be really careful when you give <laughs> these lectures. <laughs> Okay. Uh, second question is uh, how did the integration hypothesis dialogues with uh, uh, Stephen Meathen's book, uh, The Prehistory of Mind, where he says these modules integrated into the modern brain? So I was just wondering if uh, there's a bridge between your hypothesis and his hypothesis of uh, modularity and the integration of these modules. Yeah. So, uh, so Stephen Pinker. The idea. No, uh, Stephen Meathen, Stephen? Uh, the prehistory of mind. Oh, uh, the idea of modularity. Yeah. So the idea of modularity is is uh, is fundamental to the kind of things I'm thinking about, right? and that is that uh, uh, as human beings, uh, although what we see in behavior is a uniform behavior, that they are uh, that's possible from different modules in the brain that somehow work together. Okay? They pass on information from A to B to C to D. Okay? I, it is a very powerful idea, one that I believe in. Uh, and the integration hypothesis, I think, is very, very consonant with that idea in that the idea is that uh, human language is made up of many, many modules. But two modules are what I call alpha and beta. That is uh, grammar, and, which is the E system and uh, uh, words, which are the L system. So these are two different components, exactly two components. There are many other components, but these are two components that we can, uh, we can uh, link to uh, other systems in nature uh, with birds and uh, primates. So very, very much uh, consonant with that. Okay. Um, so now I'm getting nervous about, was it 16% or 13%? <laughs> I really better get that right. Yeah, thank you so much. Hello. Uh, I wanted to ask you about, there's a researcher here in, in University of Sao Paulo called Vitor Nobrega, and he defended in 2018 an hypothesis called the isomorphic hypothesis, talking about how the E-system and the uh, L system would have like the same impact in the evolution of language for us. Uh, how do you understand this capacity and this integration between both of them? They, do they have the same impact for us? You're talking, you're talking about Vitor. Yeah. Uh, could you uh, repeat what you said about isomorphism? It's like he says that both both systems that you talk, he, he calls it like because he's from uh, another area, he calls like the lexical uh, capacity and the uh, syntax, syntactic capacity, the syntax. So he's talking about how both of them, in his way of seeing it, will have the same impact in this construction of language. Do you think that's real? Do you think that's the way it, it happened, truly? Are those mechanisms, they have some sort of 
different uh, integration when it comes to our language. I understand. Thank you. Um, I was on the committee, by the way, uh, for his uh, dissertation. Very, very fine dissertation. Um, so uh, Vitor's idea, Vitor Nabrega's idea is that, so he, ac he accepts the integration hypothesis, okay? the E system and the L system. Uh, they're fundamentally different, but uh, his idea is that the L system is not quite like the primate system. The L system also has properties that look like E system. Okay? That is, that both are somehow syntactic in nature. Okay? It's his idea that uh, words are not just these um, um, uniform entities, but they're created by a, a grammar uh, on their own. And so the same system is working on both sides, which made it possible for integration to occur because they're not so different. Okay? And the reason why integration happened in human beings is that uh, unlike primates, which have systems which are not uh, E in any way, but it's L, purely L. Okay? But in humans, the, e, the L system took on properties of E as well, which made it easier for the two to get integrated. Uh, it's, we still have a long way to go, but it's a very interesting step, a very interesting idea. Thank you. Hi. Thank you for an excellent talk. Very interesting. My question is, um, so the selective advantage of the lexical system is pretty clear to have, have words. What would be the selective advantage to pattern production? And would it be related to song, do you think? So um, Charles Darwin had this idea that, that Homo sapiens, uh, before, they, before we started to talk, we sang to each other. Okay? That's what some people call, what Fitch calls the pro, uh, song proto-language. And the reason why he said that was, uh, so these are amazing and brilliant observations by Darwin. He said, uh, birds have an impulse to sing. You know, they're not told to sing. They just have this impulse to sing. And humans have an impulse to speak. Babies are not told to speak. They just start to speak. Uh, birds have this uh, acquisition stage where they are singing not full uh, songs, but let's go sub-songs. Uh, human babies have, uh, before they start to talk, uh, the stage of what's called babbling. Okay? So there are many similarities between birds and humans. And uh, his idea was, that in fact, it, it comes from the same system. Uh, and that, uh, I mean, yes, uh, he often, he did not show too much sense of humor in his uh, writings, but he was a little bit funny when he said, well, when humans were singing to each other, maybe they're trying to attract each other like birds. So that is the, the advantage. Uh, we started with song, just like birds. Thank you for, for your marvelous uh, lecture. Do you think uh, this uh, integration leap is something similar to a critical, critical mass that sometimes is necessary in some chemistry reactions, that uh, everything is there and you need just a catalyzer, an enzyme, and suddenly all the components, they react and, and it happens. Um, is this the model that you have in mind? Thank you. Um, it is true that uh, for when Homo sapiens first emerged in Africa, we believe through genetic work that it was a very small group, maybe about 8,000 to begin with, which is tiny. Uh, and it's almost a miracle that we survived. Um, in fact, the reason why Neanderthals, which are much more powerful and much more well-adapted species than us, 
disappear is that by the time the Neanderthals were disappearing, their population shrunk to about the size so that you can put the entire Neanderthal population in a uh, soccer stadium, a football stadium. Uh, so uh, Homo sapiens were a very successful uh, species, no doubt about that. They keep growing and growing and growing. So yes, I think there is something about uh, critical mass to be, uh, to be said, but uh, that was not enough. There, there was this cognitive leap uh, that maybe is related to critical mass. Uh, I hadn't quite made that connection, uh, but uh, the, that would go along with the idea of diversity. And diversity could come from mass. Okay? If you only have a small group of people, they tend to think the same, they say the same things, but as you get larger and larger and larger, and you recognize everyone's idea, as opposed to the powerful, small, suppressing other people's ideas, uh, then you get critical mass and diversity and more creative behavior. So, yeah, I think there is something to that, but we have a little bit of work to do to make that connection. Thank you. Professor, first, I want to say, man, I loved your lecture. Wow. <laughs> How do you think we can prove the integration hypothesis? I, I don't know how to prove hypothesis. I'm a physicist, so I don't know how to prove hypothesis in this kind of area, so I mean, I'm really interested in this point of topic. Well, I'm hoping that you could prove it. <laughs> <laughs> My work is done. <laughs> I give these lectures hoping that somebody will pick it up and, <laughs> and prove it. And they come to me and say, here's the proof. I say, voila. <laughs> um, all joking aside, there are ways, there are ways. Uh, although if integration hypothesis actually happened, it happened 120,000, maybe 200,000 years ago, we can look at today's human brain, for example. Uh, much of the human brain is like monkey brain. Okay. 90, 95% is identical. We could compare the two, and I'm actually starting to do that. Okay. So much of our brain function is the same as, uh, uh, let's say, tamarind monkey, uh, which is something that many people have looked at. Uh, and tamarinds and humans are able to do pretty much everything the same way, except for one thing. Humans are very good at uh, abstract uh, computation that tamarind monkeys have been shown to completely fail. Okay. So where does the abstract computation come from? Uh, neuroscientists have identified the source of that abstract computation uh, as belonging to the Broca's area. Uh, tamarind monkeys have a Broca's area, as we saw, great apicism, but the Broca's area in tamarind monkeys uh, has not developed to generate abstract computation. We have. Uh, and so that is one way in which we can, and, and that is creating patterns like the E system. Okay? L system is somewhere else in the brain. So. Uh, Somehow, the, the, the E system developed in, um, in uh, um, the Broca's area uh, in homo, homo sapiens. Okay, so that's half of that. Now the question is, where, how did the E system creating patterns, creating grammar, where did that come from? Well, one interesting hypothesis is that it comes from tool making, which we saw. Uh, people who study tool making in um, sort of abstract ways have observed that the pattern of thinking, the pattern of organizing thought to create these uh, stone tools is very similar to grammar in human language. Uh, people have even uh, put professional tool makers and uh, people who are able to 
simulate tool making by uh, you know, Homo heidelbergensis, Homo erectus. They put them uh, under fMRI, okay, brain, brain scanning, uh, to show that when they do that, uh, the Broca's area lights up. Okay. So these are the kinds of research, very exciting, that I hope that we can do in our, our, our SPEC project. Okay. But we have a long way to go. It's just a hypothesis to try to solve the puzzle uh, that we see uh, in, in, in these ideas about language evolution. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your talk, Professor Miyagawa. It's always amazing to uh, hear you say uh, this uh, information. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, about two years ago, I heard about the uh, research in the San Francisco Bay Area at the uh, changes in the song of birds in the Bay Area at the period of pandemic because uh, after, after the COVID pandemic, they had to deal about uh, noise pollution. And when the noise pollution uh, stopped in the uh, uh, COVID <coughs> uh, uh, period of uh, uh, is isolation, uh, they uh, change the volume of their uh, songs and when the cars return to the streets, they m uh, maintain that change and uh, the songs is different from the pre-pandemic era and this is uh, uh, interesting because uh, this in, uh, environmental change changed the way they sing, no, they, but they don't, doesn't change the way they uh, uh, make their songs. Uh, it's just uh, uh, the way they sing. And this is, is some way analogous to the way we speak. We don't change the way uh, we change the way we speak, but the, we don't change the computational way we speak. Um, I'd like to ask you if uh, these gradual changes in the way we put words, the way we uh, put things, can contribute to the uh, merging hypothesis and component alpha and component beta. These gradual changes can explain this merging compon components a alpha and component beta. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's a, f a fascinating observation. I, I had not heard about this, although I'm not surprised. You know, uh, pandemic changed a lot of things. Um, I know that uh, by, uh, uh, um, by, stop by stopping driving, for example, air became cleaner so that, for example, people in areas of India looked up and they saw for the first time in their lives Mount Everest. They had no idea that it was there, uh, but smog cleared and they saw uh, Everest. I'm not surprised that birds, birds, right, uh, were no longer uh, needing to sing as loudly uh, because they didn't have the competition. Um, and I, I think this is, uh, I know, um, Professor Navas was telling me about frogs, the way that frogs develop their communication system because they're communicating in very noisy uh, environment. They developed ways of communicating that was not just acoustical, but movement uh, that could be visual uh, so that uh, noise did not get in the way of communication. So uh, yeah, I can see that. I'm uh, not sure that this is going to lead to changes in fundamental changes in behavior. It, it may be just a one-time thing. Um, you know, uh, we sort of started to communicate differently as well, right, uh, because of the pandemic. You know, our way of greeting each other is, can you hear me? <laughs> By unmuting uh, and, and so forth. I hope that we can get back to normal.
uh, but it's going to take time. So, uh, we'll, time will tell whether uh, birds' uh, behavior has changed. I think it may be too short. Two years may be too short to fundamentally change their behavior. But it's interesting that they were able to adapt so quickly. It, it shows you that nature is able to be agile and quick in adapting to uh, behavior. It may not have been enough time for descent with modification to occur, uh, but time will tell. Thank you. Hello, Professor. Uh, do you hear me well? Can you hear me? OK. Uh, well, uh, throughout your speech, the units of analysis were our brain and us, humans, how it developed. But today, we are, we are in a growing complexity society. And we, humans, are becoming more interdependent with machines, for example. And my question is, how do you see the, this co-evolution of humans and machines? And um, we have a, a growing shared collective global communication and cognitive system be being developed. And more and more, the individual human can't do much. How do you see these things in the future? Your question is a very important question that is fundamental to our society and something that we have to ask uh, in very serious ways. If you look at history of uh, human-machine integration, you see this uh, for the first time in uh, 19th century with uh, industrialization. You know, before uh, steam engines uh, and, and other technologies came into society, 40% uh, of the population, at least in the United States, uh, worked in farming. Okay? And they were plowing and, and, um, and uh, other manual things. Okay? Uh, but once machines came in, mechanization of farming occurred. Um, we went from 40% to today just 2% of people who are farming. And 2%, uh, about 2 million people, produce food for 320 million people. This is what mechanization, human-machine combination, made it possible. Uh, but what that means is that there was a massive loss of jobs massive loss of jobs from 40% to 2%. Okay. So what happened? Uh, you did not see massive unemployment. Okay. What happened was that uh, the US government saw what was coming, and they created a policy where they said, OK, everyone must stay in school until they're 16. 16. Uh, this is compulsory education, and that until you're 16, you cannot work. Okay. This was a massive public policy with enormous commitment of funds to, uh, to create schools, to upgrade schools, to, to uh, improve education. And this is what made the creation of a well-educated, flexible population that made the next stage, uh, the information society possible. Okay. So coming back to today, your question, what's going to happen with human-machine combination? Well, uh, what's clear from that lesson that we learned from the 19th century industrialization is that education is, is going to be key. Okay. We're seeing exactly the same thing. Depending on what you read, uh, between 14% to 47%, between 14% to 47% of jobs that exist today are going to get lost to automation. Okay. Half of the jobs will be lost to automation, to machines, AI, and so forth. Okay. So that, that's the, uh, um, 
uh, the bad news. The good news is that, according to the World Economic Forum, 65% of young people, you and your younger ones, the, the Z generation, those who were born in 1997 and later, you guys, 65% okay, of you will be entering jobs that don't exist today. 65%. Okay. So 50% of the jobs will be lost, but 65% of you will be going into jobs that don't exist today. Okay. Very similar to what happened in the uh, uh, 19th century. What's going to be the bridge? Well, the experience from the 19th century, education. Okay. We've got to come up with better education. Okay. Our, 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 our mind is prepared, as we, as we saw. Okay. We're, we are a learning entity. We are, we're, we are ready to learn. We absorb, we're like a sponge. Okay. As long as we're given the opportunity to learn, uh, we can do it, and we can move to the next phase. But we got to provide for agile, quick, continuous learning. The World Economic Forum projects that those who are going into the workforce, uh, you guys, you will need to spend equivalent of 100 days a year just studying, just to keep up. Okay. Let's, a third of your time each year, you, you have to engage in studying. So this is going to be a fundamentally different society. It's probably more like what we were before, uh, when we were homo sapiens and we were uh, becoming uh, a symbolic being. We're spending four or five hours a day sort of you know, being creative, uh, playful but creative. We don't do that too much anymore because we're working so hard. We need to go back to what we saw us as earlier homo sapiens, where we give ourselves three, four hours a day of playful learning. Uh, otherwise, we're facing a very dark future. Uh, and so many, many things to think about. Uh, I think I, I'm very optimistic that as society, we can do it as long as we have public policy that uh, institutes the right kinds of programs for education. That is key, That's absolutely key every time when we have massive intervention of technology. Okay? Education gets us to the next stage, and the next stage is even better than before, uh, but, but it's going to take an entire society to do that. Hi. Hello. My question is similar that my colleague um, Murilo. So in view of the hypothesis about the origin of language, the question is, what is the future of language? In view of the impoverishment of language motivated by virtual platforms such as WhatsApp or Instagram, in this sense, if we use language to think about, if, you, if we use language to think, how it's possible to articulate talks if you are being conditioned to a mechanical language? To conclude, is the impoverishment of language a means of alienation of the mass? What is the future of language? So I was not able to understand clearly. I, I'm terribly sorry. Is it possible for you to rephrase your question? Impover, impoverishment of language by social medias. What is the future? What is the future of language? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, we still haven't figured out the past of language. Uh, so what, what is the future? Well. One thing that we, I mean, I can tell you with certainty is that our brain is going to keep shrinking. Okay. Uh, and the reason is because of the human-machine combination. You know, more and more of the machine is doing what our brain used to do. Okay. And if, the, um, if we don't need the brain membrane to do all the computation, brain is a very expensive uh, membrane. 
that eats up lots of, you know, our brain eats up about 25% of uh, caloric intake. Okay? I mean, um, it, it, yeah, uh, although it only weighs about 3%, 2% of our body weight. So it will continue to shrink. And so uh, that means that uh, we have to, I mean, I, I suspect that we're going to become even more abstract in the way that uh, we think about things. And that more and more things will create that will allow us to do more things, but outside of our body. What will happen to language as a result of that? No, I, that's a good question. Um, it's only time will tell. The one thing that you can say about human language that's absolutely, absolutely true is that it keeps changing. It doesn't sit still. Okay? Our parents are amazed and surprised and shocked at our, our language compared to their language. And you're going to be shocked at how your children speak. Uh, and your, your kids are going to say, Dad, Mom, you're so old-fashioned. Okay? Uh, so language never sits still. It keeps changing. Some say that human language always changes to a uh, more simpler form. Okay? I don't think that's right. Human language doesn't... I mean, if you compare uh, Latin or Greek, Okay. or older languages of Africa to today, it's no less complex, no more complex than today. So human language uh, is stable in its complexity, but it just keeps changing. Each one, Portuguese, Brazilian Portuguese will look very different 100 years from now. Okay. So time will tell uh, how it's going to change. It cannot change too radically that it no longer becomes human language. I mean, people have uh, come up with these uh, uh, artificial languages uh, to, uh, uh, to try to have a universal language. They, uh, and then they, you try to teach it to babies. They cannot learn because it's not human language. Babies are equipped to learn human language. Okay? So you don't want human language to change so much that it's no longer human language. Then it cannot be tran uh, transmitted to the next generation. So. I, I talked around your question because I don't know the answer, but uh, it will keep changing. Hi. Hi. Uh, hi. First of all, Professor, I'd like to thank you very much for your presentation. I found it pretty fascinating. And I should start by saying I am not a linguist, I am, <laughs> I am not a, <laughs> I am not a linguist, a molecular science student, and in our course, we actually learn about of a lot of fields, and one of them is biology. And in biology, we have this idea of a LUCA, a common ancestor of all living beings. And one of the most important empirical evidence of its existence, is its existence is the shared genetic code of the, of the genomes of our species. And meaning that maybe life arose, life arose only once in Earth history. So my question is, there any, is there any idea or hypothesis of how many times the, did the language arise in human evolution and what kind of empirical evidence could back it or support it? Could you repeat? What, I, I'm really fascinated in what you said about biology and, and this fundamental knowledge that you learn from biology. Uh, about Luca, you mean? About? About Luca the common ancestor. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. so, so is there any kind of genetic evidence for see, the... Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. A genetic evidence. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because all yeah, human I, beings have the same nucleotides. Yeah, basically. yeah, yeah. So um, is there a way in which we can look at the genetics uh, uh, to see uh, uh, not, emergence? Not, not, exact, not exactly. It was just a parallel. Uh, my question is, is there any idea of how many times 
did the language evolve in human language? And how could we support this hypothesis? Okay. How many times human language evolved uh, and can we tell from the genetics? Uh, uh, or can we tell from anyone? For anything? Uh, for anything. Yeah. So I'm not sure if I'm going to ask, uh, answer your question, but there's very fascinating uh, research. Uh, it, it has to do with biology. It has to do with genetics. And the logic is actually very simple. You, you'll, you'll understand it immediately. The idea is that we started as a species in Africa, uh, the earliest Homo sapien, maybe about 250,000 years ago. Okay? One, uh, one tribe, about 8,000 members. We started out very small, okay? um, less than the number of students at USP. Okay? Uh, and then it kept growing, and it kept dividing into different species. So here's the logic. Can we identify by studying the genetics of early Homo sapiens when the first split occurred? Okay. And we can. We can look at the, the genetics right, uh, of uh, early Homo sapiens to see when that first split occurred. Here's the logic about human language. Whenever that split occurred, human language or some source for human language must have been there before the split. Why? Because after the split, both branches had language. Okay. So the seed for the language must have been there prior to the split. Okay. So the key thing here is to figure out the genetics of early Homo sapiens and that point where the first split occurred, uh, and you can say with certainty, with absolute certainty, that human language was there before the split. You see the logic, right? It's a very simple logic. Well, um, people are now doing very sophisticated genetic work on uh, uh, Homo sapien early population in Africa, and we now have some idea of when that first split was. Yeah, about 125,000 years ago, we think, you know, give or take a few tens of thousands of years, but it's in the right ballpark, right, as what we've seen from tool making and other things. So, uh, human language or some seed of human language was there uh, at least 125,000 years ago, before the split. Uh, we need to fine tune our knowledge of early genetics to really get, get it right. But by looking at the split, to your question, we can see you know, how many times uh, human language evolved. Today we have about 6,500 human languages. Okay? So it kept really splitting. But it started with presumably one language or one whatever. Okay? What, what, what that looked like, we have no idea. Maybe it was Brazilian Portuguese. <laughs> I don't know that I answered your question, but uh, it's something that I'm hoping that we can, in the spec uh, research, uh, uh, we'll be able to, uh, we'll be able to uh, uh, engage in. Hello, Professor. Um, thank you for the lecture. It was very enjoyable. Um, so I've heard of research before uh, with primates in which they could uh, communicate very simple sentences using sign language. And before asking the question, I checked it on my phone, and uh, many researchers say that uh, that isn't a, a, uh, a sign of uh, the LC the E system that you're talking about. Um, but even uh, because the the primates are randomly choosing signs to uh, tell the sentence, and, and these researchers thought they were actually trying to re recognize the language. Um, but isn't the randomness, uh, the random process of trying different things and seeing what works, uh, a sign or at least some primitive type of uh, an e-system? That's the question. Thank you. So these are like apes or monkeys and trying to teach language to uh, uh, primates. Um, so initially, uh, human beings that we are, we try to teach uh, great apes 
um, he, uh, language, vocal language. But apes don't have uh, the vocal tract that we have for speaking. And so they couldn't really learn. But then, as you said, someone figured out that, that you can also teach them sign language, and they are perfectly capable of using our, our hands. And when they did that, they, uh, they discovered that apes are able to learn something like 800 different words. That's so amazing. Uh, and they really were learning. Okay. One thing that they could not learn was to combine those words into sentences. So they didn't, they didn't have an E system that generated patterns, but they had a very robust L system, lexical system. And they were very good at learning those. Uh, and so, yeah, the L system is, is very much alive in primates. And through training, you can really extend uh, their, their capacity okay, to learn. But the important point is that they are L system. Yeah. Um, so uh, one of the sentences that I saw was uh, formed by those primates was something like, uh, you give me orange. Would that be like a, some kind of atom uh, in the L system? Uh, or could it be just random uh, uh, combinations of the, the lexical systems that they did know? Or could it be some kind of very primitive uh, E system? Yeah, so uh, people have claimed that uh, you can, in fact, teach them sentences, uh, but I think that's been pretty much debunked. Uh, that uh, although the, the researcher says, you give me orange, and they give you orange, uh, I think the behavior is triggered by orange, and then whatever nonverbal behavior the researchers had. Okay. Uh, that, that's, that's the latest research as far as I know. Okay, thank you. Maybe one more. Yeah, thank please. You. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you for your lecture. It was, uh, it's like um, I have been saying lately, you bloomed, bloomed my mind <laughs> with your talk, your first class. So with this saying, I, have, I would have two questions, but I would make only one based on what he just asked. So uh, some- I'll answer the easier question. Okay. <laughs> It's just, I was wondering because um, we have some uh, birds, for the Pisita seed groups, you know, like the parrots and so forth. They are able to learn stuff. They are able to learn how to repeat some, uh, you know, things that we say. So, but many times they are able to repeat this um, in a correct moment. You know, if you ask something, they learn how to answer things for you. I was wondering. Are, are you talking about infants? Or? No, about parrots, like uh, birds. Parrots. Yeah. So is there any connection between uh, what they do in their brains with how we do this to communicate? Or is just repeating stuff? Yeah, uh, they're very good at repeating. Incredibly. And, and they have a vocal system that allows them to uh, produce very accurate pronunciation. You know, it's very odd. Uh, what, what evolutionary benefit can they, can they have from being able, able to imitate human speech? Uh, but it's, it's not like they're communicating, uh, but they are uh, somehow able to repeat uh, in an e-system. I suspect that they don't have L system, but they're just simply repeating the words somehow. Okay. So uh, I suppose, but we, I, I think we know very little. There, there are people who know about this. So uh, it's a very good question. I, I, I want to look into that. Yeah. So uh, I didn't answer your question, but uh, uh, it's a very good question. I thank you. <laughs>